everybody. Welcome to Grow Your Art Pitch Night. My name is Drew Worden, and I'm the Assistant Dean of the Entrepreneurship Program here at NEC. And we're very excited to share with you the eight finalists who will be competing for these grant awards tonight. Um, we are broadcasting live from Boston and other parts of the country, I think, for some of our finalists and very excited that you can hear all of this live tonight. I want to take a quick moment to introduce our review panel to all of you and then we're going to get started with our first presenter. First, our special guest artist for this week's Grow Your Art Residency, Maria Schneider who you'll be hearing more from uh, throughout the week in various EM workshops and a special jazz concert with NEC students. Uh, the Dean of Community Engagement and Professional Studies, Tanya Maggi, and NEC's president, Andrea Kalin. Thank you to you three for joining the review panel. So a special congrats to all of the eight finalists. First, you should all be really proud to have advanced to the finals and I hope you're all feeling good. We're looking forward to cheering you on tonight. If you are watching live, please feel free to throw some uh, love in the comments for these folks who are presenting tonight. It takes a lot of courage to present for something like this. And uh, so please cheer them on. Okay, we're gonna get started here with Darren Dean. Welcome, Darren. Hello everyone, I'm just getting set up here. <laughs> Changing this, let's see. Okay. <laughs> One moment. Ah, here we are. <laughs> okay, hi everyone. My name is Darren Dean. I am an NEC 2019 grad and a jazz alumna. And my project is called the Resolution Tour. The Resolution Tour is a virtual series of seven shows, including a live Q&A and panel, an original film screening, and a concert featuring women in jazz. So why the Resolution Tour? Well, the Resolution Tour in its name reflects my, 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 my hope to resolve the dis disparity within jazz community between genders, the lack of representation, and the overall equality when it comes to the music. All About Love, Jazz and Gender was a film that I created for my senior project, and it interviews pianist Jason Moran, drummer Terry Lynn Carrington, and my peers also. And here's a little trailer of it. So this is for your final project? Yes, this is for my capstone project. Then that's Unfortunately, can't watch the whole thing. But the panel and Q&A of the Resolution Tour includes prominent jazz artists, music industry execs, and together with the audience, we come together and have a really great dialogue and engagement around gender and equality in jazz. These lively discussions have been really amazing and really dynamic at each Resolution Tour. The concert is a pre recorded online concert that features compositions by women, and a high level recording and video of the concert will be made available for purchase and merchandise on the Resolution Tours website. The partners include New England Conservatory, whoop, whoop, <laughs> Berkeley College of Music, USC Thornton School of Music to help with the built in platforms of promotional services, audience members, and such. Who's my customer and to who does it matter? Um, my target demographic is young women and men, students, musicians, educational institutions, universities and colleges, and last but not least, the jazz community. In 2019, we had our first resolution tour at the Dick Clark Productions and it went amazing. It was really great here in my hometown of Los Angeles. And in 2020, the following year, we had the Resolution Tour debut at New England Conservatory, and it was awesome. Jason Moran was as a guest panelist, and we had a lot of great conversation. In order to achieve my marketing demographic, I'm partnering with sponsors and merchandising the concert, as well as ticket sales and having virtual market analysis in order to fulfill my marketing strategy. 
The top goals of the resolution tour is one, to educate, two, to provide a platform and expose women and history of jazz to people, and three, to facilitate lively discussions um, and, and have agency for women in jazz. The, the Grow Your Art grant funding will help me with the tour implementation, administration and production, and the associative costs like media, panelists, marketing, and videography. And thank you so much for your time and consideration and for this moment to share with you my project. Thank you, Darren. Okay, we will move to six minutes of questions with the panel now. Can you see or hear us? I can. I'm just trying to end the screen share. I'm trying to go back into Zoom. Uh, let's see. Oh, OK, there we go. <laughs> yes, I can. Well, first, can I say something? This is Maria here, and I just applaud your energy. And, and the video had such beautiful quality. You know, I watched your whole um, video, and it was really wonderful. The, the production values were great. And I wanted to ask you a couple of things. How are you planning on funding the recording that you want to sell? Where, where is that coming from? Right. So for the recording, it's for our funding for it is coming from sponsors and it will also come from applying to grants and additional funding like crowdfunding and um, keeping donations kind of central to the collaborative elements of it. And um, for the recording, it would be a cost that would happen before, of course, before we present virtually. So having a built-in structure where we have some funds and be able to record it with video and sound would happen beforehand with okay. donations and sponsors, okay. yeah. And, and I wanted to ask, I, I have a couple more questions. One was, you had a statistic, I wrote it down here, that 72, and you said it, I think, 72% of adults playing jazz as adults were men. And I was actually shocked that that meant there were actually 28% adults that are women because when I go to schools, there's almost no women a lot of times in the bands and, and in younger schools. I, so do you know anything about that statistic? Where did that come from? So that statistic came from the National Endowments of the Art in their 2008 research and survey that they did. And it was basically just a case study of all of the art forms. So they had jazz, they had dance, they had all these interdisciplinaries. And it was really interesting because um, a part of the, the, the study was also saying like, who goes to jazz? And the, the, the audience was educated, older. And, and I think it's because of the, the age range, but it was really interesting that jazz when I read that survey and research was an older person's music so I think one of the reasons why there's that the idea that we don't see very many women in jazz even at this like very young level is just because the the age gap and then also the encouragement for them to participate in the art form mm -hmm. Does anybody else have questions? Because if they don't, I'll continue asking, but I want to- Yeah, go leave. ahead. <laughs> no, go you, ahead know, you, you have more? Um, no, no, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so another is, so this, I obviously would really like to see the ball move forward in this area. Um, uh, but one way I see it as happening is for young kids to get exposed, you know? boys and girls. So it's, it's something that they just see out there as a possibility. And I was wondering if there's any possibility of you somehow getting this thing as a kid's conversation or as a, or kids just hearing the music. And then the other question I have is, how will you measure success of this project? That's a tough one, I think. 
Yeah, I, I really appreciate your question because that, you know, it starts, it starts at a very young age, especially, you know, Britney Spears audience didn't start, you know, these are young girls dancing to your music. So the development for kids to see themselves on the bandstand, both young boys and girls is really important. So through the partnerships with the institutions like elementary schools or educational like nonprofits, it will really be a funnel into tapping into an audience that's beyond my scope as an individual artist artists and also bridging the gap between how how our young ears the young ears of this next generation can actually take ownership and claim themselves to say like hey like I know who Mary Lou Williams is or hey like I love Vi Red and John Coltrane and all of these amazing artists and get to see artists like me and my friends and up and coming that are close in relationship also share in the music. So it becomes more communal through institutional partnerships with elementary schools, high schools, and the, the younger age. I just want and, to piggyback on the measure. Sorry, go ahead. Do you... Oh, no, I was to say that was a second question, but if you wanted to. I was just going to ask a little more about success. And, and also you had, you had mentioned in your overview that this was sort of proof of concept. So I was you know, curious about how you're going to be checking this over time and sort of how you see this growing. Yeah, so, you know, the proof of concept initially started out in, in Los Angeles at the Dick Clark production uh, screening room. And so my intention through the, the work and measuring success is to give audience members opportunities to find their way, to find their voice from the concert. Like, what are the takeaways? And with the partnerships with institutions, now they can go and say, hey, I want to go to USC or I want to see this happen at the school or here's a program that's really great. Like Dee Dee Bridgewater has her um, a woodshed network, which is educating women in jazz that I'm an alum of. And there, there are opportunities now through this resolution tour as a platform to expand and kind of grow the education um, network that audiences can take away. And and to answer the question of how do I measure success, I would say I measure, measure success, one, with like, are people coming to the concerts? Two, um, it, over time, how many people are growing in listening to jazz and also being a part of the conversations? And also what have the institutions that the Resolution Tour has been involved in, how have they been insulary, uh, insulated and taken that outside of the vacuum and grown the conversation? I think we have one second before we have to move on. So I'm not sure I have time for my question. Um, do I have time, Drew? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. Super fast. Darren, thank you so much. It's really great to hear about this project. Um, I'd be curious just to know how your plans have evolved and changed in this pandemic era that we're in. Um, I, I saw in your budget a lot of focus on ticket sales in particular. And what does that look like if people aren't necessarily returning to live concerts in the same way that they were in the past. Yeah, the, the pandemic definitely put a different level of creative energy behind how to make this happen for sure. Um, what I really like about the project and even the budget in its scale is that it's built in. So even without institutions that I will partner with um, who could also cover the cost of, of certain things and have a built-in infrastructure, it's still profitable in that way. It still comes out with um, a net income of $8,600. Um, but the most important thing is really heavily in the market analysis. I was doing some research and um, concerts, virtual concerts are going up. When the pandemic started, they initially first were free. And now when people are trying to figure out how to monetize that, the market um, analysis said that there is a growing market for virtual concerts. So I think working with a team and, and the grant funds and the sponsor funds would help me be able to catalyze um, the online virtual space in, in partnership and conjunctions with the institutions to really make it happen and profitable. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Darren. Thank you. We're going to keep moving. And next up is Raphael.
When I was an NEC student, I had no idea that there's a performance art and activist meeting space only three blocks away. The more time I spend in Boston, the more I realize how segregated the art scene can be, strengthening coalitions between Boston native artists and those who arrive in the city for school is vital to the health of our community. Good evening. My name is Raphael Natan. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I'm the events coordinator at Makeshift Boston, a community art space in the South End and the founder of their brand new education initiative, the School of Arts and Social Justice. The School of Arts and Social Justice is an open mic for teachers. Local community members propose classes and I make sure they run and everyone gets paid. Occasionally I recruit teachers to address an urgent need. For example, last semester I brought in a vocal pedagogue to teach a class on projection and diction while wearing a mask. In our first semester, we served approximately 80 students and averaged a profit of $80 a class, half of which was paid out to our instructors. The Grow Your Art grant will allow us to increase our teaching stipends to a more equitable $200 per class, as well as upgrade our accessibility measures. Now, the School of Arts and Social Justice is different from other adult education programs because faculty are majority LGBTQ. We don't follow a certificate program or assign homework. We focus on student mental health by placing value on arts and community building instead of job training. And we try to be as accessible as possible. We also have a majority working class demographic. Now, a lot of arts and education programs do not prioritize accessibility and affordability. And this is where Makeshift is filling a gap. We don't charge a mandatory admission fee. We only ask for voluntary donations. We plan to continue online classes even after the pandemic so that students with physical disabilities and chronic illness and parents who require childcare can still attend. A professional captioning service is the most accessible way to include deaf, hard of hearing and ELL students. While this service can cost about $200 a class, it is essential to our mission. Now, this is a very exciting community initiative and the work I have done to host these classes has also helped me grow as an artist. I learned how cell phone mics work in the social justice filmmaking class, allowing me to significantly improve my live streams. The Reclaiming Imagination workshop helped this year's theme, or inspired this year's theme for my elementary school songwriting students and teaching a class on the music theory of protest chant got me hired to edit chants for a picket line. Finally, here are some testimonials from students and faculty. Thank you, and I would be delighted to answer any questions you have. Well, I'll, I'll jump in off the bat. Thank you very much for a fabulous presentation and really great work. Um, I just have a question about your budget. Could you help me understand um, the ins and outs a little bit? Because it looks like um, it looks like your your expenses are actually a little less, um, uh, unless I'm just reading this all wrong. So, can you help me understand sort of what the grant actually helps you do and yeah. sort of why you need it upfront? Absolutely. Thanks. So, um, the budget that I outlined is for one semester of classes and a semester is 10 classes. Um, basically, we are upgrading from being entirely donation based and only paying teachers 50% of profits to having a guaranteed $200 teaching stipend. Additionally, um, we are upgrading from volunteer captioning service to um, a professional one, which will um, help um, provide accessibility to the community. Um, I can go back to my budget slide if you want. Oh, no, it's okay. Nope, I got it. That's great. Thank you. Hey, Elle. I, I, it's so great to see you and fantastic work. I just am, am thrilled to see this happening and congratulations to you for, for making all of this happen in, in, in such a robust way. Uh, I'd be just curious to dig into some of the partnerships that you're developing with community organizations, with some of the schools and how you're 
um, what the back and forth looks like as, you know, schools or, or um, partners express interest in certain types of classes and then how you develop them in response. Uh, I'd just be curious to find out a little bit more about that process. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what I do is I, um, I basically just put out a Google form and advertise it as widely as I can using makeshift social media, using my own social media, um, telling people, DMing people, um, just getting the word out as best I can and just saying like, hey, we're starting this thing. You can teach any class that you want who's interested. And a lot of people will respond and say, um, I would like to teach this, or I would like to teach that. And um, I look at those proposals and I pick the ones that I feel best represent the intersections between arts and social justice. And um, most of the people who propose are also community organizers. So we had instructors from Boston Feminist for Liberation. We had instructors from Alston Brighton Mutual Aid. Um, we had an instructor from Learning with Lennox, which is an anti-racism initiative. And um, we've also had a bunch of musicians who've come in. Ava Sophia did a class on songwriting for social change. And um, basically, um, it's mostly community curated in that the community proposes the classes and I just use the platform to make them happen. Um, I do, as I mentioned, I occasionally will ghost curate and reach out to specific teachers. And I reach out to, um, I reach out to mostly individuals rather than organizations, um, but I am thinking about talking to Solidarity Supply Distro, which is, um, the food relief organization that is currently using makeshift as a distribution site. Um, yeah, free groceries every Monday if anyone needs food. Thank you. Raphael, your, your work and your butt off doing amazing things. So first of all, congratulations on that. Um, I have a few questions. So when people come in and do a class, they do just one class, is that right? Or um, sometimes a, a few, and do you create a sort of a syllabus of sorts or something if they do a few? So um, in our first semester, we had one teacher that did two and everyone else did one. My goal is to get as many teachers paid as possible, um, especially in a pandemic, especially in a time when, um, when um, employment is uncertain for a lot of people. So um, that's my fundamental goal. Um, but when I like the teachers, I usually will invite them back. And a lot of the ones that taught in the first semester will be coming back for second semester. Um, right now, there's only one of me. And I would really love to see this grow to a place where um, we have the admin capacity to make a syllabus in advance. Um, currently, that looks like occasional Instagram posts that say upcoming classes and regular updates to the website when we have classes. Um, and I just try to make sure that students have at least a week's notice to register and set aside time in their schedule. Um, one comment I'd like to make is I think um, you have a difficult job because you have to decide. So there's this intersection between that I've never thought of before is arts and community organizing. But that, that scale of what you choose is, um, you know, it's very uh, subjective. And you, you personally, you know, could, if people are like, well, you know, why wasn't my class picked or whatever this is, do you have some sort of clear, something you put out there to sort of protect yourself in terms of what you choose, who you choose, why you choose it, so that you don't end up with a mess? Um, I think that those conversations um, are so specific to the individual. Um, I have not experienced it so far. Um, a lot of people who are um, familiar with Makeshift as a space kind of already know what we do. 
-hmm. And so most of them are the people proposing classes. So I have that built in safety net, but I'm also like, I recognize I'm never beyond critique. And if something, if someone has a concern with the way that we're running programming, they should voice that concern and we should listen to that concern and discuss what to do about it. And um, that discussion should be, ideally that discussion can be had um, with the people who are bringing up the concern. Mm -hmm. And um, I trust my own like de-escalation skills that I actually learned at NEC working as a house manager at Jordan Hall. Um, and like, I know how to be very polite to people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. That's a life skill. <laughs> and, and one other thing is what's the youngest age that you will teach at, at, at your center? So um, anyone can register. Um, if someone is like, if I find out that someone is under 12, I might reach out to their parents. Um, but we actually had one youth class in our first semester. The queer poetics in quarantine was taught by a local youth and um, mostly high schoolers showed up for that class. So I mentioned it's mostly adult education, but there are some youth classes that happen as well. And um, I think for youth classes, we want youth to teach them because we're building this co-learning space, we're building this peer space. And so we want to, we want people to feel comfortable in that space with their peers. Thank you, Raphael. Well done. Thank you. We will move now to Hunter McKay. Okay, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me tonight. Uh, I'm really honored to be here and I'm so excited to be here representing Abacus. Uh, I'm Hunter McKay and Abacus is the nine piece ensemble that I co-founded with fellow composers Skylar Hagner and Alex Quinn. And your support would allow us to document our upcoming tour in the form of a video album. And it would result in the personal, engaging and professional content that when paired with a publicity campaign would really make a meaningful impression on our target audiences. Our ensemble formed just before COVID and in November we were awarded a Jazz Road grant um, through South Arts and that's going to bring us back together at the end of the summer for a two-week tour of Maine and New Hampshire. So that grant covers all of the expenses related to the six performances in two clinics including artist fees, travel, food, and lodging, um, but its scope is concentrated solely on bringing touring artists to rural areas. So it does not include the recording or large-scale publicity components and therefore the $7,500 from the Grow Your Art grant would enable us to piggyback off of this tour by adding a video recording project as well as a publicity campaign. And for that reason, the Jazz Road funding uh, enables the educational and community impact with the Grow Your Art funding as the entrepreneurial counterpart to that mission. And it would transform what would have been a short-term project into a sustainable long-term business by acting as a prototype and the model of that prototype would prove the viability of more projects that combine live performance, education, and online engagement in a similar way. Um, and that would eventually culminate in a video record label based around our ensemble's personnel and our musical aesthetic. Therefore, the impact of the Grow Your Art funding would ripple over many years by subsidizing the expenses involved with the production and publicity of this project. And those include online advertising, album manufacturing, domain hosting, and personnel expenses, including mixing and mastering engineers, a publicist, and producer, videographer, and recording engineer, Will Gorman, who will live alongside the band for the duration of the tour. And he'll bring a professional mobile studio to every step, including rehearsals, live shows, clicks, as well as produced video shoots for our video album. And then handling the video post-production is video and digital content producer and editor, Hilary Kerrigan. Her recent work with Skylar was just selected for the Master of Art Film Festival. And in the end, we're gonna be producing three types of content, the video album, 
which will be recorded separately from our live shows at some of our scenic tour venues, Airbnbs, and other venues across Maine. And will also be released as an audio only version in the form of a, of a physical CD uh, with exclusive bonus tracks. Uh, and then we'll also be producing live footage as well as behind the scenes and promotional clips. So with this kind of content delivery format that's centered around audience growth, our project will enable us to further ramp up our touring um, right as venues begin to open back up. And it will also allow us to monetize our products both online and in person. And in light of the pandemic, I think people are hungering for live music more than ever, but are now accustomed to this online experience. So with your support, we'll be able to offer our audience both. Uh, so again, thank you so much for this opportunity and I'd love to take any questions at this time. I guess I, I could jump in um, if it's okay. I'd like Please to do. ask you what your educational um, component looks like precisely. Like you go to Portsmouth, Portsmouth and you're doing some kind of, um, what is it? Yeah, so um, the we're gonna be doing two clinics during the tour um, and those are gonna be at Portsmouth Music and Arts Center and the University of Southern Maine, um, Southern Maine Junior Music Academy. And so those will both be geared towards um, middle and high school aged, uh, the, the Southern Maine Junior Music Academy being middle school. And that was actually a camp that I attended as a middle schooler. Um, so I'm very familiar with their format. And um, what, what's gonna happen is we're gonna go in and do a tour during, I mean, a clinic during the day where we're gonna talk about um, ensemble blending, composition, and as well as a little bit of music and jazz history um, and give them a little bit of exposure to um, all of those elements. Um, and then we'll do the, the clinic in the evening. Um, and we're going to tie the clinic in with the performance. So during the clinic, we'll talk about some of the music that we're going to play and some of the musical elements that the students can listen to, um, to just kind of tie in a music appreciation element into it as well. Um, and then, uh, we may, depending on, um, if we have enough high school students, there could even be a composition uh, component related as well. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. and, and maybe too, when you talked about the behind the scenes um, video and stuff, how exactly are you planning to roll that out? And how are you planning on um, making this be something when you perform that you keep these audiences that you, you know, what's your, your strategy that this thing has a life, it continues, it doesn't, it's not a one shot deal. Right, yeah, well, um, that's a great question because I think that's where the Grow Your Art funding really comes into play because um, without the Grow Your Art funding, it kind of is a one shot deal. So we would do our tour and we would have an impact on these communities and that would be great. Um, and we would, we would get that organic audience growth, but without the ability to publicize ourselves to wider audiences, we wouldn't be able to grow our audiences outside of the New England area. Um, and so in, in being able to publicize and spread our, our um, music to further audiences, um, we'll be able to enable further touring, which would then enable us to repeat this by doing clinics in different areas, um, by building similar audiences um, in those areas. And um, so the, backs, the behind the scenes footage will be, um, We'll be recording all of our rehearsals as well as um, just those in-between moments behind the backstage and everything. Um, and they're, each each uh, produced video is going to be released on a set schedule and the behind the scenes footage will be released in anticipation of that with a specific marketing plan for each individual video that will be released separately to extend the timeline um, of our of our publicity campaign. campaign. Um, so, yeah, that, that's how the backstage footage will be will, will be utilized to extend it. Can I ask a little bit more about that? And by the way, congratulations. It's, you've done an incredible amount of work. I love the fonts and the color <laughs> scheme and all of that as well. It's beautifully presented. So if oh, that's reflective, so of, it's reflective of, of the music, it's really terrific. Um, but as you're thinking about, so I just want to understand the video. So they will go along the tour. You'll be releasing them sort of alongside this particular tour, or is it sort of a, a culmination that then launches the next project? Right. Is it sort of a summary that, uh, that allows you to go beyond this immediate tour or is it a feeder for this tour? And is the educational component built in or is it performance based sort of what, how are you, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, I'm um, sorry, I broke up a little bit in the middle, but I think I got the question. So um, 
we're we're going to be um, during the tour. We're going to be producing a lot of content and posting it online. So like story type things and more casual type content that will be filmed like with our phones and stuff to begin with that that process of of organic growth. But at that time, we won't have a, a lot of content to be really aggressively publicizing it. So the tour is more of a content generation period. And then we'll be able to extend the life of the project by releasing those um, on a schedule following the tour. So, and the, we'll also be able to um, extend it for longer um, by breaking it up into, into smaller videos and then culminating with the release of the physical CD, which will have those bonus tracks um, because we'll be able to produce one video and then release it while we're still working on the production end of the other ones. Uh, one thing I'll say just, you know, from my own experience is um, assessing your audience. It's, it's important to assess like all the different people that hear your music and you're talking about the educational uh, component. And these are also future fans of different players in the band and whatever. So it's important to think about um, what you can uh, maybe share from this whole thing to carry on to them, you know, that you you offer something in all of this for for them that maybe goes beyond just that clinic that you did. I don't know, it's something to think about. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. And actually, so that part of our, um, part of our like um, secondary content, I should, I should, so our main content is a video album and then all of the other, the content for the most part has a lot of educational components, which is why um, one of our target audiences is music students. Um, and so we'll be, a lot of the promotional content will be centered around that educational side of things. So we can kind of blend those two community outreach and performance sides. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hunter. Well thank done. you. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, we will move now to Yay. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, uh, how can I share my screen? All right. Oh, yeah. Got it. Can you see screen? Yes. All right. So, um, hey, everyone, um, dear uh, EM Grant Committee. My name is Ye Huang, and I am an NEC Jazz Performance Major alumni. So during this, pro, uh, during this pandemic, we as musicians experienced uh, hardship. The loss of music performances, venues, tours, opportunities have created a big hole in our lives. Every musician is struggling to find new ways to perform, to connect to their audiences and getting their music heard. But the question is, how are we able to do that while well, everything is on a pause? Today, I want to present you my project, City is Our Sound, Online is Our Stage. And I'm asking for a 7,500 um, EM grant. The goal of this project is to connect local businesses, spaces, and musicians in the city of Boston by renting the beautifully designed music uh, locations and producing music videos there. Then upload it to my music company's YouTube channel, Consai, which has 150,000 subscribers for all over the world. My team and I spent months uh, brainstorming and pre-production for this project with the center focus of how we can revive the music scenes in the city of Boston, together with the hope of helping local businesses to grow and building a bridge in the different areas of art. We want to provide a physical stage for talented musicians to perform and a virtual platform that everyone have the opportunity to shine and with highest quality, without barriers. We intend to collaborate with a professional and audio crew to ensure the production will be the best quality. And in this project, we embrace all kinds of music and musicians with different ethnics and cultural background. We want to focus a production that link these music groups and business spaces together to create a stunning visual together with beautiful music. And my company, Consign Music LLC, have done several uh, local musician features before this project and we received positive feedbacks from all over the Boston about the quality of production and our products. Our dedication to discovering the true talents is sets uh, us apart from others. 
The main expenses would be towards marketing, promotion, venue renting, staffing, equipments, and music compositions. Uh, as a performer, I'm really passionate about helping my colleagues and fellow, uh, fellow musicians to thrive and create new music. And as a young entrepreneur, I'm constantly thinking of new ways to shape in the music industry and connect businesses together. I believe this project will, uh, will impact the entire city and Boston music community and heal the music scene. So I strongly believe that we have the ability to make this happen and influence the city, influence the entire community. Thanks so much. I can jump in. Um, hi, great job. Thank you so much for presenting tonight. And I really enjoyed watching some of the video clips that you had sent with your grant. I'd be curious to dig in a little bit to hearing about the relationship building with businesses and what you perceive as the benefit to the, the business. Uh, okay. and, you know, as you've started to do this more and are, are, are gathering responses, you know, what have those responses been and what's been the follow through? What's the sustainability piece? So uh, I personally have a small business called uh, Cosa Music LLC. So I, in the previous uh, parts, we reached out to many uh, local businesses such as uh, Record Co. and also uh, Berkeley as well, and NEC, just to uh, try to figure out how we can uh, collaborate in the future. And in my company, we also have our own product, which is uh, designed microphone and also designed music cables. So I was thinking we can use this entire product side of my company to sustain the uh, production, also uh, music recording side. So this two will be intertwined. So I think she was asking it because it, it's a question I had. Um, okay. The feeling that I had, and I loved the videos, but um, what I wanted to see maybe as a beginning of the video is to actually see the business, maybe to mm -hmm. see the business owner speaking about ha letting that person present and say, you know, at such and such restaurant, we're so happy to do this concert in our beautiful venue, blah, 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 blah and you see mm -hmm. it and then you see the thing so that it truly benefits that business. Because if you do that, lots of businesses are going to want to do this. That's, that's a feeling I had, but the videos were very beautiful, but I, I could have never told, told you what business that was in when I watched. Yes. So that uh, the productions we did is actually in my apartment. So everything we recorded is in our apartment uh, business center. So we didn't record a local business yet, but I oh. was thinking using this uh, project to uh, jumpstart what we have. I yeah. see. Um, let's see, I had another question. Um, yeah, the other question I would have, it was similar to one that I think I asked Raphael, and that is that you're curating and choosing what music you do. And I think it's a tremendous benefit to these musicians to get such a high quality video, which they truly mm -hmm. are. So how do you choose who gets this? You know, that's, um, that's something that's tough, you know? Yeah, so for now we have an entire list of people that we want to collaborate with, but uh, it has all kinds of genres, such as a uh, string quintet, uh, also a duets of like pop music. So we want to combine all these uh, genres together first. So in my uh, grant application, I said, we want to uh, use 10, 10 groups as, as uh, this first part of the project. So we want to select these 10 um, groups for now that has different uh, genres. But in future, we want to incorporate all kinds of music. Yeah. So I have um, a question that kind of ties back to, to Tanya's first question, uh, and actually sort of brings a couple of them together. So um, it's again, it's about the relationship with the business. Sorry to go back to this, but mm -hmm. the relationship with the business. One of your goals, you said, is to create contacts between the musicians and the businesses. Are you imagining then that the venues would hire these people going forward? Is it a kind of one-off with a business? Are you imagining that it becomes a house so, gig? Like, I, I'm curious about this. So uh, basically I want to uh, inspire the local business to reach out to music, music part of the, uh, the, and the Boston scene. So 
we for now we are all isolated like business is business and music is music but if there's a link between them that can be built for example just uh, asking them to play the music in the stores also like uh, playing their uh, playlist that can be even possible so it is not one off I, I want to you know sustain this entire project to be you know future building yeah definitely linking this um, business and music together Can you just clarify then, just sort of building off of that, the the facility rental? Um, mm. I was just confused about that component, given that it, it it sounds like you'd really love to have more of a collaboration with businesses. Um, so how does the facility rental? The I think in your budget you have two thousand dollars for facility rental. What is what is that for? So I reach out to two of my friends who own the store, the Newberry. And they say if they are not able to make some kind of composition for booking entire night, for example, for production, and they won't uh, be able to help us because they want to sustain themselves, uh, even though they're uh, making no money. So I still want to pay the venue with something. So uh, in a way that we actually like collaborating, not just you know asking for favor. So you wouldn't be doing this in off hours from the business. This would be. No, we will do it off hour. But okay. uh, since I reach out to the friends and they want to charge me for something, I still you know, want to uh, do a negotiation negotiation with them. Yeah. Okay. But in the future, I would love to do uh, like music galleries, art galleries, and museums that we can do you know entire. Uh, venue to ourselves yeah i love the idea i think it's beautiful and the videos were lovely and yeah there's really potential to do something cool there so yeah thanks so much thank you yay thank you okay uh we are going to take a 10 minute break and then we will come back for our final four applicants for tonight so at 8.04, we will resume for the second half, 8.04 Eastern time, I should say. Okay, thanks, we'll see you soon.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. We are moving on to our final four presenters tonight. And first up is Emily Ang. Good evening. My name is Emily Ang, and I'm honored to be here representing Lyft Music Fund. We are seeking funding to invest in our organization's data management. Lyft Music Fund's mission is to make achievement in music more accessible and equitable. Every month, we award microgrants of up to $250 called Lyft Awards to Black, Latinx, and Native American musicians ages 11 to 22 to offset costs that are essential to their growth and success. As we all know, the field of music has serious issues with a lack of diversity. We believe this is largely due to how expensive music is and how current systems disproportionately make it more difficult for Black, Latinx, and Native American families to gain access to wealth. So some examples of the costs of music. As a conservative estimate, private lessons in a metro area cost $50 an hour, which is 20% of a weekly minimum wage salary. Lyft Music Fund helps alleviate these and many other costs for musicians, allowing them to level up and reach their full potential. Since our first application cycle in September 2020, we have awarded $12,570 to 96 student musicians. They hail from across the US representing all areas of musical study. While we are very proud of this number, our goal is to continue to grow the amount of money we award each month until the full need is met. So far, we have only been able to fund about 40% of the total dollars requested and about 69% of the student applications. So what's next for Lyft? Well, next year we will award $4,000 a month, doubling this year's monthly funding. And we are kicking off our crowdfunding campaign to raise the next $50,000 needed. We start this coming Saturday. So rather than requesting $7,500 for more Lyft awards, I come to you today to ask for help in building our infrastructure to create a more efficient, sustainable future for Lyft Music Fund so we can raise more dollars and award more students. With the Grow Your Art funding, we are interested in investing in our data management. Currently, we operate using a combination of MailChimp, Airtable, GoFundMe Charity, and Google Drive, but this is cumbersome. We estimate that every week we spend between one to two extra hours manually reformatting and inputting constituent data. Further, our limited functionality is holding us back. We don't have a centralized place where our team can input their contact staff with volunteers, donors, and applicants. Having one database that the whole team can access allows us to build strong relationships with our constituents and ultimately raise more money and awareness. So we are interested in upgrading to Bloomerang to handle our constituent management, email marketing, and online giving all in one place. We are also hoping to hire a three hour a week data and operations manager to maintain our data and help with the various aspects of our operations, applications, volunteer management, donor acknowledgement, et cetera. Effective data management, while not glamorous, allows us to operate more effectively and focus our efforts on growth. As everyone on the team is currently volunteering their time, every minute spent is valuable. I'd like to leave you with one quote from one of our first Lyft Award recipients, Ik Pemisi Ogandare. She says, it's the idea that there are people out there who care about young artists and musicians and are willing to support us in our musical aspirations. That is amazing to me. So your $7,500 will help Lyft Music Fund operate and fundraise more effectively so we can award more dollars to more students. Thank you so much for your consideration and I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Jump in. Uh, hi, Emily, it's really hi, great to see you. It's great uh, to see you. And wonderful to hear about this project. I love how you've taken sort of a, a vision and really gotten into, um, you know, how you can affect change on a very, very grassroots level. I just, I love seeing the whole scope of this project and what you've been able to do in a short amount of time is really extraordinary. Thank you. I'm, I'm curious to know if you've done some work around connecting some of the recipients to one another and A and B, if there is a piece of this where you're also tapping into some existing organizations that are supporting young musicians of color. So I'd just be interested to hear a little bit more about those two aspects. One, wonderful, yeah. Um, so to answer your first question, uh, we created a Facebook group for all of the recipients um, and we're realizing that Facebook might really not be the space that, uh, that this generation uh, uses so much. So we're looking into other, uh, other spaces to create for them. Uh, we have an upcoming virtual gala concert on Saturday. And so they're all performing on that. And there's a sense of community built around that. So that's very exciting. 
Um, to answer your second question, we've partnered with this really wonderful organization called I See You, um, Affirming Representation in Music. And they're taking care of like the mentorship side of things where uh, we just had one of our first events. Um, it was a panel to help with the uh, application process to college uh, for music students, which can be very, um, it's so different from the normal college application experience. And um, so that panel, uh, we invited Lyft Award recipients and then there were some of their students that they had recruited separately um, to come together and provide support to students in these other ways other than funding. We realized that there are so many things that go to building a successful music musician and we're providing funding aspect of it and hoping to, to reach out and hold hands with people who are doing the other types of work. I um, saw so much potential in this. I had the exact same question, just feeling that this could be an ongoing, I love that it's a, a, a small lift, but then it could lead to big things, them connecting to each other, but also that idea that other platforms can give you, uh, because everybody wants to increase diversity, but they don't know how to tap the audience. And, and you're tapping that audience. And so I think if you can then reach out to some of these organizations and say, we have the people here and they're looking for what you have, then you can really be a great asset to these other organizations, which might feed into support for what you're doing. And you know, there's, there's great potential. Mm -hmm. um, you had said something about 30 minute concerts that you do. Could you describe those? Yeah, so uh, mini concerts for micro grants. These are our main fundraising tool. Uh, performers, uh, they're mostly friends or friends of friends. Recently, they're, they've just been volunteers who have uh, found us on social media. We did a push to uh, recruit volunteers and they're, they're volunteer performers who uh, put on a 30 minute concert, speak to their networks and their friends and family about the mission of Lyft Music Fund and set a fundraising goal. And then they're responsible for uh, asking people to donate. And um, they've been very successful. A large majority of our fundraising has come from them. And it's been a great opportunity for, in a time when many musicians aren't performing live, uh, this was something for, that, for people to work, work toward, um, in, especially in September and October, in October when we had a real big push for these. Um, people really jumped at that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Can, can I jump in on that? Also think this is an amazing project and those small grants can make such a difference for, for students. And so I think this is really phenomenal. So thank you. Uh, and 12K in years, that's a really big impact. So it's a lot of people that you've affected. So um, I'm curious though about, about the sustainability piece of it and the donor engagement. And mm -hmm. so the concerts in the pandemic, you know, work really well because people are kind of hungry. I wonder how you're thinking about ongoing donor engagement and as people get back to a more normal in heavily inverted commas life, how you're thinking about evolving that so that this sustains um, over time and grows. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, hope, the hope is that we'll be able to do in-person concerts. I mean, so many of the, the mini concert performers say, oh, I, I can't wait to do this with my chamber group or something like that and, and do it in person at a, in different communities. And I think that also gives us an opportunity to make it have a place in the real world. Uh, right now, Lyft Music Fund exists on the internet and, uh, and there, there is the, the screen that's a barrier between us and the world. And I think giving people the, the option to perform a concert for their community in person uh, will will bring a, a, an even greater humanness to to donor engagement, and so uh, maybe it's not just concerts; it could be um, other types of informational events. Um, I can see uh, giving um, prospective Lyft Award recipients um, some like, in person master classes as well that we could open up to to a larger community. So, um, kind of, I, I'm excited to get back to the to the real world and normal things when we can put lift out there in the community. Um, just an idea, I, you might consider reaching out to Neris, you know, cause I could imagine as, as an artist saying, hey, I'd like to give 
five free tickets to a concert, you know, and for Lyft students that can come and meet afterwards or whatever, meet the artist or whatever, you know, there's so many, I think you talked about mentorship and I, I was curious what meant, I think you did in your, in your proposal, right? Was it mentorship in there? Maybe not. Maybe I'm confused. That's, uh, oh, we're partnering with other organizations to offer mentorship. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, I, I agree. I think that's a wonderful idea. Thank you all. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Emily. Next up is Gabriella. Hi everyone, my name is Gabriella Martina. I'm a vocalist and composer. And my project is the recording of the album States. I'm gonna make this work, there we go. <laughs> so States is uh, referring to the United States of America, but as well also to a state of mind or a state of being. Um, it will be um, a, an album that has the core elements, voice and drums, which were the first human musical elements. It will have world play in there, um, words with meaning and words with no meaning, so gibberish, spoken word. A DJ will help me out with the electronical aspects of my works. There's going to be dancers, storytelling and powerful stage images. The collaborators are my group that I have been playing with for almost 11 years, and they were all part of the creation of my most recent album, Homage to Gramlis, that fuses Swiss traditional folk music, yodeling with other musical genres from the United States. I'm planning on guiding the audience straight to this page of my website in order to make them buy my new album, States, for me directly. Next to my existing core audience that I have here in the States and in Switzerland, here are some other ways that I can create a new audience. I wrote a cookbook called Dinner with My Neighbor that I created during the pandemic. And I made a little short movie um, called A Journey Through the Inside Another Day During the Pandemic um, that I sent to a lot of competitions and that got some recognition there. And also through my connections with Swiss organizations in the United States. This project, the recording of the album states, is an important evolution of my existing slate of projects because my hope is that this album could be a breakthrough for my musical career as a musician. I have a mailing list with over 3000 followers worldwide and I'm in negotiation with the record label We Jazz from Finland. The total expenses for this recording is $32,000, but I have already secured $15,200. And that includes an award that I just recently received from my hometown in Horb in Switzerland of $10,000. And with your support, I will get one step closer with my ensemble to reach the next level in the music industry. People in this industry need to get paid for their work, especially now. Experiencing a live concert will be so much more after this pandemic stands still. And the recording of the album States makes a difference because it'll bring up political and historical stories that are so important to address during this difficult time we're all in. Where and what will our states be in 2022, in 2024 or in 2030? Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Sorry, I'm just gonna, oh, there we go. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I'll ask you something and that is, I, you know, amidst doing all this publicity and get it, getting everything out there, which a lot of times means offering a lot of things for free, how do you plan on holding on to the value of what you create so that to the end of trying to do something where every time you make a project, you aren't looking for funding, but that it starts to self, you know, uh, and, and these are tough questions. This is the big tough thing for everybody. Yeah, yeah. No. No, but I'm glad I'm glad you're asking. I mean, I, as I said, like, I try to guide the audience to my um, website directly. And 
the, or, the way I would do that would basically be social media. So Instagram, Facebook, you know, kind of really advertise, advertise, set out campaigns. I also have a help there, um, Mr. Eric Gonzalez, who's just going to do the stuff that I don't want to do. And I'll do more the like direct in, um, in person as good as possible, obviously on Instagram and with the audience um, directly. Um, so it's more personal. Um, but right now, everything is kind of more online, obviously. So it would have to be there to bring up the numbers. And then I think for me, it's really live concerts where I catch, you know, the eyes and the talks afterwards with, you know, presenting my cookbook, my, my works, my CDs, my vinyls to really make them leave them with a good experience and that they actually, yeah, want to want to buy something. Mm -hmm. Let's see if there was another question I had. I, yeah, you know, I actually thought uh, in what in looking at your whole application that this that the cookbook, oddly, was um, a, a truly kind of entrepreneurial thing. You know, where it's kind of going beyond music to maybe draw people into what you do from beyond that wouldn't find you otherwise you know and ha has that felt like a fun thing for you and do you think you've picked up unique fans from that or is it now that you're doing cookbooks too like how how do you feel about that i mean it's both it's it's of course people who already knew me and they were like what now you have a cookbook so it's kind of that mm -hmm. but then obviously also just people who randomly saw that somewhere and, and then also discovered my music. And that's kind of my goal because these are, it's kind of like another niche that, you know, they can find my website through another angle. And that's why I mentioned it there. So it's it's been super fun and I would, I would do it again. <laughs> Volume number two. <laughs> do you sometimes feel like I do, like a plate spinner, just trying to keep everything going? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I had this a similar sort of question and I was, it's, you're doing a lot. <laughs> it's really quite impressive. Um, and so I'm just, you know, how you see these things connected and, uh, and how you see this, it, do you see this as sort of getting you over a hump or is it, is it always this kind of thing? So it's a sustainability question, right? Sort of how you see this growing into the next project and the next. Did I understand that you sort of view this as, you know, states in, every couple of years, kind of a different version of the same evolution of the same work? No, not really. Um, I mean, states, it refers to the United States. So there will definitely be a lot of that in there. And as you maybe saw, like the the second slide is kind of made as with the colors of the flag and all that. So it's kind of like, um, you know, bringing up political and historical um, stories made obviously um, with music, you know, creative with spoken word, etc. But it could be, you know, something that continues. I mean, that's actually a cool idea. So but it, it, it would be just the recording of one album so far. Hi, Gabriella. Thank you Hi. so much. It's great to see your work. Um, I'm, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the kind of educational outreach component. Um, you know, you had it on your slide and a little bit in your, uh, in your grant proposal, but uh, I'd just love to know how you're utilizing some of that work um, to kind of promote your mission and how that feeds into your identity as a, as a musician. Yeah, sure. I mean, for me, it's kind of natural. That's why I didn't actually say it out loud again. It was just on the slide. But for me, the recording of an album is just one big part, big one big component. But then it's really like, OK, if you have that music now on a CD, which, you know, is is, you know, it's a nice achievement, but still you have to bring it out there. Then people come to concerts one once the pandemic stencil is over. And then um, I always do like masterclasses, workshops, community outreach. That's kind of 
all in one. I know it sounds like a lot of things, but it's kind of like one doesn't go with, without the other. And it's for me clear if I go to Europe and can finally present my other album that I unfortunately couldn't release yet uh, because of 2020. Um, I, I'll, you know, give workshops about yodeling. I, I introduce my band to my Swiss friends or, you know, other people in the world wherever we go on tour. Um, so that that kind of comes with it. That's for me clear. Great. Thank you, Gabriella. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> we are moving now to our final two presenters for tonight. And next up is Thomas Cooper. Hello. Um, just let me know. When... Uh, hello, my name is Thomas Cooper, and I am a master's violin student uh, at NEC, and I uh, am the artistic director of Fermata, which is a uh, a young artist performance organization in the Boston area. Um, we were founded in 2018, and our mission is to change the polarized culture of classical music by reinventing and, and reinvigorating the live concert experience. Um, this project, uh, which is entitled Black Virtuosity, um, is uh, our largest project to date. And it is uh, one of uh, a project that's very close to my heart because it's um, showcasing two composers that um, I uh, have fallen in love with very recently, um, one of which is Florence Price and the other is, uh, and uh, please pardon my French pronunciation, Chevalier de Saint Georges. Um, St. George's uh, is the focal point of this um, season, and we are going to create an album and um, produce uh, three concerts, um, two of which will be in the Boston area and one of which will be in Bar Harbor, Maine. Um, this con this uh, project will be in three phases. Um, phase one is the chamber music phase of uh, our um, uh, of our, our project, which will um, feature just the string quartets. And this uh, phase of our project is actually largely complete. Um, we have secured funding for it and we have recording dates with uh, Fraser Performance Studio at WGBH on March 9th and March 29th. Um, what I'm uh, specifically seeking funding for is um, phase two of the project, which will focus on this violin concertos of St. George's. Um, we are very fortunate and really happy to have uh, NEC violinist and faculty member Su Bin Kim join us for one of the violin concertos and the other three violin concertos will be featured by three other uh, violinists within Fermata um, and we will be presenting this with chamber orchestra. Um, this part of our project will uh, be the most um, extensive part and will cost $15,900 and we are seeking um, the full $7,500 grant to um, supplement this complete cost. Um, and this cost includes uh, largely um, paying each musician their due, including the 11 piece chamber orchestra that we were present presenting this with. Um, the uh, other aspect of the project that um, is important to highlight is um, the uh, concert tour, which um, as of now stands at, th at two three concerts in two cities, but talks are underway with the Bar Harbor Music Festival and Delaware Beach Classical to present uh, additional concerts with this tour. That was perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have I, great to great to see the project develop um, into uh, into different things. So congratulations. I had a question about your target audience. You talked about really wanting to um, capture people who don't yet know and love classical music. And you talked about engagement with communities on the touring part of this. Um, yes. And so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about that and how you're, how you're envisioning doing that. Um, yes, um, so we um, are partnering with uh, two local um, organizations to sort of in, in terms of community. Um, uh, Fermata's concerts are always free. 
Um, and we also like to partner with local organizations to give back to the community in some way. So um, the two organizations that we happen to be partnering with um, in Maine and Boston respectively are Westside Food Pantry, um, which is a local organization that um, helps with uh, combating hunger uh, throughout the Bar Harbor and general Down East area of Maine. And the other organization in the Boston area is Help Come Home, um, a charity that I am involved with. And um, we also will be addressing in this particular case, um, food primarily. Um, and we are also talking with uh, local schools and um, summer camps in the Bar Harbor area, as well as schools and sort of um, after school music programs in the Boston area. Uh, to try to um, introduce this music to a wider range of people. Uh, Vermada has always um, sort of uh, envisioned going to people who don't yet know and love classical music. And we have, an, we have already seen success with a concert model where um, we tend to have on average 60% um, based on the surveys that we hand out at each concert, 60% um, of the audience which has never attended a classical music concert and um, another 10 or 15 percent of that um, being uh, people who have attended a classical concert but do not love the art form the way um, we do. Do you do any kind of uh, pre-concert or post-concert discussion, question, answer sessions or something uh, to bring life to these composers and Yes, um, so every single Fermata concert follows a very similar format, which includes a post-concert talk, a pre-concert talk, and uh, the presentation and breaking up of a single large piece. Um, at Fermata, we have two types of concerts, a flagship concert and a pop-up concert. The pop-up concerts tend to be shorter, sort of uh, bite-sized concerts that are aimed at people who do not yet love classical music. And the flagship concerts tend to be larger concerts featuring um, a much larger program and um, usually aimed at people who may have been to a Fermata concert before. Um, we also tend to uh, use break any rule, if you will, um, of classical music presentation, which includes venue, repertoire, um, staging, audience position, and um, uh, order of works. Um, so, that would include, at one Fermata concert, we played in an abandoned factory. At another con concert, we played where the audience sat in swings hanging from the ceiling. We have house concerts. We have concerts in brand new concert halls like the one out in Concord um, at Middlesex School. We have concerts in traditional venues like we hope to have at the Gardner Museum um, with the St. George's Violin Concerti. Hi, Thomas. Great, great job and really interesting to hear about the evolution of, of this project and your organization. I'd love to hear a little bit about the impact of, of this work on the musicians who have been involved and on you. Um, how is it changing? Or I don't want to presume that it's changing, but how is it um, impacting you and your own musical growth? Um, how is it impacting the um, you know, future thoughts about the organization and um, what you might like to do as well as some of the impacts on the musicians who've been involved? Um, wonderful question. Um, I'll answer uh, the impact on myself and then the impact on the musicians. Um, I actually known about St. George's as a composer since I was a kid, but I never really investigated his music. Um, and as you know, Florence Price is actually a relatively recent discovery. Um, I think that for me, uh, I, I've fallen in love with the St. George's Concerti. And actually it's affected me to the point where I've even considered um, doing a, a doctorate in, in, in just those 16 violin concerti um, and, and you know, all in between and, and seeing what it's like to, to sort of rediscover a piece of music that does not have the scholarly work and tradition that Beethoven or Mozart might have. Um, and on that note, I think um, in rehearsing the Florence Price Quartet, um, we've discovered that there's a lot of issues with playing music that doesn't have scholarly work already done on it. You know, there's a singular edition of the G major quartet and it is riddled with 
mistakes, but these aren't mistakes that we can confirm necessarily. They merely are notes that don't necessarily fit. So we're discovering in a way how to approach and break down music that does not already have a tradition assigned to it. And in a way that it feels very, um, it feels like we're at the vanguard of, of sort of a, um, a, a scholarly study of, of these works. And it, it's, it's very special in that sense. Um, and I guess it, we, we feel as though we have a little bit more of a responsibility in a, in, in a way to be the, some of the earliest interpreters of this music. Not that there aren't now, um, I would say hundreds of, of interpreters, but hundreds is not hundreds of thousands over 200 years. Um, and that definitely is special for everyone involved in this project. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to our final presenter tonight, which is actually two presenters for this project, um, Linda and Benjamin. Hello everyone, my name is Linda Numagami and I am a 2015 NEC alumni and this is Benjamin Adler. We are the co-founders of the Clarinet Maestro Festival. Our festival is inspired by the work of Yehuda Galad, one of the most influential clarinet teachers of our generation. We hope to make this high level of teaching accessible to all clarinetists. At the two festivals we've had thus far, we've served 282 participants and viewers. We will present the third iteration of our festival this summer, where our nine faculty will offer private lessons, master classes, workshops, open forums, and concerts. We are requesting $7,500 to go towards scholarships for our upcoming virtual summer festival, as well as audio video equipment and services, the rental of Maimon Hall at the Colburn School, and additional administrative help for our 2022 hybrid in-person winter festival. There are thousands of clarinetists in school bands and orchestras. Many of them will never have the access to the kind of high level education they want. Festivals like Aspen, Tanglewood, and Interlochen are extremely selective and can be very expensive. So we're trying to bridge the gap between where students are and where they want to be. The high school student from a small town, the college student on a budget, and the adult enthusiasts alike will have access to a cohesive education, expanding their growth with a different school of clarinet playing. The reach we've had has been possible in large part to scholarships, the pricing plans we offer, and Maestro Golad's diverse alumni network. Participants get three lessons from three different teachers from our core faculty, and they get to play in a masterclass with a fourth teacher. Viewers can watch a class with the principal clarinetist of the Cleveland Orchestra for just $5. Through our partnerships with the Reed and Clarinet Manufacturers Buffet Crampon USA and Van Doren, we were able to offer partial scholarships to 76% of students who applied for them, along with four full scholarships. Our partial scholarships range from 10% to 60% of the tuition costs. We want to double the amount of full scholarships and increase partial scholarships at our virtual summer festival. Although technology has allowed us to innovate and maintain our passion, music thrives when experienced live. Students are yearning to get back to in-person learning, and we owe it to them to make that happen. Thus far, it's just been the two of us running CMF. To transition to an in-person festival, we'll need administrative help in addition, in addition to audiovisual services to maintain our online audience. As musicians, we are responsible for creating a community that will thrive and last for generations. The NEC Grow Your Art Grant will allow us to expand our scholarship program and business resources. Especially now as COVID-19 and inequalities threaten a new generation of musicians, Clarinet Maestro is committed to nurturing the classical music community through accessibility to a fantastic education for all. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this having been a past nobody knows this clarinet player. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> and would have loved to have had an opportunity such as this. So I have two questions. Um, uh, one is either I'm looking to the left here because um, are the students able to then connect with each other? We asked that question of the other group. And also, have you had 
I'm curious if this thing um, grows and grows, if it's possible that it can be almost like a template if you've imagined it, um, going uh, offering it to other groups, even making whatever infrastructure you create almost an open source kind of thing for viola, for, you know, other instruments and yeah. things. So the first part of your question was, uh, sorry, could you just wrap? The first part was um, students chatting with one another. Sure. Uh, so we had a lot of turnover from the first festival in the summer of 2020. A lot of them returned for our winter festival and they told their friends about it. And um, so there's a great turnover. Uh, we, we have a um, Discord dis page that we set up where the students can interact with each other. Um, we also have a Facebook group and um, our Instagram social, our whole social media platform, they interact with each other. We have um, a, a message board where they talk and we also uh, converse with them. We have a practice session every week with them where we have the video set up and turn off our, our uh, volume and we kind of catch up with each other. Um, and the second question would you like to take? <laughs> the second question was um, imagining it uh, growing for other instruments and have you had anybody come to you about that? Got it, absolutely. So first I think the goal for us is to establish an in-person home and because 33% of our current students are based in LA, three of our core faculty are in LA, it makes sense to do it in Colburn this time. However, we see this model being really at any uh, university or, or anywhere in the world, really. Um, we also feel that uh, Yehuda has many uh, alumni and around that are the world. around the world that are possibly also NEC alumni. And, uh, you know, we view them, them being able to first create satellites of clarinet maestro, let's say in Minnesota or New York or Boston, that they would be able to create their own core faculty and reach specific areas. And then after that is accomplished, uh, we'd be able to pursue further avenues like creating a viola maestro as a violist myself. Um, I, I have things in mind for that, but I think sort of we're focusing on expanding the clarinet part and really making that strong first. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your question. I can jump in. Hi, Tanya. And hi, nice to see you and wonderful to hear about this project. Um, I was really intrigued by the different models that you have for delivery of lessons and all, all the other services that, that you're offering. Um, I love that it's really thinking past just that there's one way to, to, um, to give lessons. I just love it. Um, I, I'm intrigued by the older learners that you're working with and the kind of multi-generational aspect of this. So could you just speak to what it's like to have, be, you know, very young clarinetists, much, much older clarinetists all sort of in the same learning space? Right. So the youngest participant we had was 12. The oldest was uh, 72 and everything in between. Um, we found it amazing. I mean, for example, our 12, our 12 year old clarinetist, a little, uh, a little protege, <laughs> uh, he, you know, he was very enthusiastic. He, he turned 13 during our festival. And then we also had one of my childhood friends, actually, she was more like a mother to me. She joined, she plays a clarinet, she plays jazz, she composes her own music, and she joined, uh, she's 58 years old, and she's such an amazing part of our festival. She's a vital part of our community. For example, we had Don Green, a performance psychologist at our winter festival, and she basically, he said, have you heard of this book? And it's by this, this man. And she said, I, I know his daughter. <laughs> I know his daughter, he's an incredible person. And just the students, whether they're 22 or you know, however old they are, they learn so much from each other. It's really not, it, they benefit from having each other there for sure. That's exactly right. And, and the adult enthusiasts, they really, you know, there are times where we will have a Q&A at the end of masterclass. And they're the first ones to ask questions all the time. They're, and, and that, you know. That encourages younger students exactly. to ask their questions Warms as well. Warms the water a bit. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay. Linda and Benjamin, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.
If you are still watching us live, please show some love for the eight finalists that presented tonight. And congratulations again to all eight of you. That was an inspiring set of presentations to watch all in a row. Um, and, and you should all be very proud of the work that you're doing. Um, very, very cool. Uh, so that wraps us up for here tonight. The committee is now going to deliberate and we're going to announce uh, the winners later this week. We're not announcing tonight. So you should, for finalists, you should just go to sleep knowing you did a great job and we'll announce uh, later this week. We won't keep you waiting too long. Uh, and also I think we're gonna put some links in the comments for our workshops coming up later this week with Maria Schneider. We have some great workshops on music business and what it takes to record an album today and how you can uh, share your work in today's world and how that's maybe different than it was a year or a year and a half ago too. So we hope you'll join us for that. Otherwise, thanks everybody and good night. Bravo.